Izzy, I would love to find you some European bee eaters. They are around at the moment, but they're usually not the most uh, obliging of birds when it comes to viewing them, but they do have incredible colorations. What we may be able to do a little bit later is try and swing past the quarantine clearings. I saw a carmine bee eater sitting there yesterday. So that we will try and do. I'm trying to check what tree that is she was feeding on. It looked like it could have been a tambuti. And it's a toxic tree, the tambuti, although animals will from time to time feed on them. And especially giraffe. I've also noticed when they do feed on them um, that they can salivate profusely. She's just eyeballing us through a hole in the center of those trees over there. Look at that. <laughs> awesome. It does look she like she has got a bit of a strange walk going on. I'm not sure if she's lame in some way, if she's got a stone in her, in between her hooves. Hard to be certain. Or if it was just some uneven ground that she was walking over, she seems to have a bit of a swagger. Let's see what she's feeding on now, if it's another Tamburti tree. Yeah, it is. No ways! I've never seen a giraffe do that. Look at how she's using her mouth to bend the tree. I'm going to try and roll forward a bit more to bend the tree down and that will be able to access the leaves a little bit more easily. That was so cool. I'm not sure if you managed to see. I'm sure you did though. She kind of gripped the branch in her mouth and bent it downwards. And I've never ever seen a giraffe doing that. So, interesting though, like I said, at this time of the year, or maybe because it's a drought, they're resorting to the Tambuti, or maybe she's self-medicating. But not many animals will ever feed on this tree. Even if we as humans use the wood to cook on, it can make you violently ill. If you are to drink the sap, it can also make you violently ill to the point that you die. But interestingly enough, the local Shangan people will occasionally make a diluted concoction of this that they will drink and then spend hours vomiting and pooing to clean their system and sweating. It's like a forced 24 hours of hell in order to completely flush your system. And it's quite interesting, a lot of the African cultures do believe in purging the systems completely, whether by drinking Tamburti sap or drinking liters of salt water from the sea. They are fans of induced pain in order to cleanse their systems, which is just quite interesting culturally. Well, sadly, I don't think we're going to be seeing any more of that lady. She has dissolved into the thickets. One animal that can feed on the Tamburti and does feed on it quite readily is the porcupine, Africa's largest rodents. And you'll often see where they chew on the bark at the base of the trees. Oh, shame. <laughs> Joey, a.k.a. the monkey man, made a monkey-like move and deleted his whole bird list. He was on 89, and apologies, monkey man, that's terrible news. Um, and, well, at least you got grown at Kingfisher. I mean, that's a good one. The other, the other 89 we can get easily, but that one there is tricky. But we'll get back up uh, up to scratch. I'm sure you can remember a lot of them, though. I'm guessing that you can just, you know, scribble down without cheating yourself. But that is also accepted within the ornithological world. Um, but apologies to hear that. Maybe a hard copy together with a soft copy is the way forward. The ground is very hard here, but I'm still just poking my head out every now and then just to see if we can't get lucky. 
some of you may remember this area um, as it is a place where the Inkahuma pride of lions called the buffalo not very long ago it was just off to our right with a feeding on it and I'm just checking now to see if there's oh yeah there's one or two bones in there let's see if we can't find the skull I'll stop here though and David will be able to show you where some of the vertebrae are. There we go. And I'm going to just do a quick scout around to see if I can't find you the skull. Before I do that though, I'm going to put my little lapel mic receiver up on the dash. Come on, work well for us. Just making sure there's nothing that wants to squash me in the nearby vicinity. Everything appears okay for now. It always fascinates me how such large portions of a carcass can simply disappear from the kill sites. I mean, the skull and horns of a buffalo are heavy. Oh, looks like the hyenas have been hard at work here. I'm going to bring you a jawbone that I've just picked up. Well, what remains of it. No sign of the skull. I'm guessing that this will be from the bottom jaw. That's typically the skull or the part of the skull that does get consumed, but the upper portion of the skull is harder to chew through. The skull cannot be seen. Go away, bird. Calling behind us. Probably shouting at me, actually. So here's a portion of, I'm guessing, the lower jawbone that's been broken and chewed in all likelihood by hyena, the bone crushers of the African wilderness. So that's quite useful. If anybody needs a false tooth, let me know and I'll pluck one out of here for you. Eh? Might be a bit big, but you can get it whittled down to size by your dentist. Wouldn't that be a, a little war story there? Okay, I'm going to get rid of this now and show you something else. I don't know if this is going to work as well as I want it to. Oh, it might. So this is the spinal cord. And I was hoping I was going to be able to look all the way down it. Which I think is still possible. I just need to reposition one thing. And then we'll be able to see oh, where the whole spinal column went. Just about, you can, well, yes, I can see your eye. So you can maybe just see mine through that cavity. But I'm spying on you through there, and that's where the spinal cord runs. Integral part of every mammal's anatomy, the spinal cord, because as soon as that breaks like that, the spinal cord, which runs through that hole, is severed, and then you're in trouble. Very good. Sometimes you just got to give the go-away birds their own medicine, put them in place. continue through the Marikani riverbed. Hopefully we're going to maybe find the Anderson male leopard, a monster of a male leopard who we haven't seen for quite some time. He lurks through these areas and while we do that, you guys are going back to the bushwalk with Jamie. And I'm currently breaking a cardinal rule of walking in the bush, so please don't emulate or try and copy this. And the reason I say that is we're right at the entrance to an active burrow and I will preface this by saying that I've been really, really careful 
we've all been really careful in our approach to this. This is definitely somebody's home and it's interesting to investigate it. There are lots, or at least when we first arrived, <laughs> I'm just thinking about war dogs coming shooting out of here. <laughs> Viam and myself will go flying into the drainage line that's behind us very quickly. Probably not as quickly as the warthog that could come running out of here. Now we've spoken about this before, about how dangerous it is to sit right at the entrance to a burrow. Personally, I don't think it's a warthog burrow. I could be wrong about that. I'd prefer not to be wrong about that, but I think I'm right. There's lots and lots of flies. There's very clear, fresh signs of excavation. And I, what I've been trying to figure out or try to look at is whether or not there's any tracks. There's another entrance just down there. You can see what I mean when I said that VM and I would go tumbling down into the drainage line. Now for new viewers, warthogs tend to back into their burrows and they do like burrows like this in termite mounds. So a warthog will back, in, back up into a tunnel and when I say that they can, they can probably explode out of there at roughly sort of the speed and with about the same amount of sound as one of the Apollo missions, in terms of their takeoff, they shoot out so fast and you just get dust and noise and I'm I know I'm not the only guide who's ever had a heart, close on a heart attack thanks to warthogs suddenly coming out of burrows and it's very dangerous. They've got very very sharp tushes, those lower tusks, not the big nice curly ones but the lower tushes that are sharpened by constant rubbing against the top ones, they can be incredibly dangerous. That being said, um, and having discussed that and having come to the conclusion and VM being incredibly trusting of that assessment in standing where we are, I think it's not a warthog. Gives us a couple of options. It could be an artfark, but they aren't the usual fly species. There's a very pale species of fly that tend to hang around only outside artfark burrows. I haven't seen any of those. And I haven't seen any tail drag marks. What quite often happens when you look at an entrance to an artfark burrow, often they rest along the side and you get just a little, a drag, pretty much like a drag mark that sits and often moves then down into the into the burrow itself. It sort of looks like this. I don't think we're looking at an art fork burrow. My suspicion would be porcupine. I think that is the consensus as to what this might be. It'd be interesting to get hold of Brent's camera trap and try and confirm that that is actually the case. Now quite, oh hold on. I've just said that about the fly species and I've just spotted one. I think it could be an art fork. I've just changed, I've changed my mind completely. Sorry. 180 degrees. These are one of the species of flies that move around outside art fork, active art fork burrows and I think that's what we've got here. So maybe this particular art fork just didn't want to drag his tail. Interesting. I was going to say porcupine, I was going to say freshly excavated porcupine. I've just changed my mind. I think that it could be a freshly excavated art fork. Interesting. We, we may actually never know unless we put a camera trap up. But this is very, very fresh and you can actually see the power of this animal that's dug and excavated under this termite mound, flicking the mounds of sand up like this and excavating an enormous amount of soil that's come out of here onto this mound and then down from this entrance and into the drainage line itself. Okay, I've changed my mind. Ooh, <laughs> there is a chance that you might see the, the ground suddenly spinning towards you at a very rapid rate. Your YouTube button's ready. <laughs> yes, have your, have your YouTube buttons ready. <laughs> As we go, both Viam and myself at risk of tumbling down into the drainage line. It's um, very loose soiled. <laughs> And now, that, now the soil's all in my shoe. <laughs> it's stuck there. It's the one disadvantage of this particular style of shoe, is it tends to collect dirt but doesn't really let it, let it go. Maybe, maybe we are looking at an art fork burrow. You can see the, the power with which this thrust into the drainage line. Oh, being very brave. Yeah, I'll pop the torch in. Huh? Now we were just, while we were, while you were with Scott, we were actually just discussing the merits versus the disadvantages of the drought in terms of our walks. 
So Xranger, you wanted to know if there would be bushwalks if the grass was high, as high as it should be. And we're actually stuck here. We, we can't, I don't think we can manage to navigate our way out of it. But if we look at, I mean, we look at the view that we have at the moment. Xranga, there would still be bushwalks. There would probably be, we might move a little bit slower. We m definitely would have a wider variety of insect life to show you. At the moment, the insect yield of this particular year has been negligible compared to what it should be. So we'd have lots of exciting insects, lots of interesting things like that to show you. Our visibility isn't as good. So we can't see as far, which essentially means you've got to take a little bit more care in terms of how you walk through the bush. Um, just in terms of listening, just taking it a little bit slower because you don't have that opportunity to see a threat ahead of time. Whereas at the moment, it's like winter, we can actually see 100 meters into the bush at times, which is a perfectly safe distance at which to see an animal and then decide upon whether you're going to move away or approach. So it's definitely, it's an interesting one. There would be bushwalks. We'd have more to show you and we'd have less to show you. It's one of those strange things. It's worked to the advantage in its own way. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to make my way out of here. Ooh. Oh well, we'll have a look at the entrance for now. Since Jen B has asked a question about porcupines, which is essentially how do they go in and how do they go out? How do they reverse in and out? And Jen, the answer is unlike warthogs, they will go head first in and they will often have a sort of a turning space within their burrow itself that they've constructed and excavated so that they can turn around and come out face forward. It's amazing the way that they get around the complications of the quills because I can sort of, I can see what you're thinking about. If you've got quills that have gone in, and then you start to back out, they're going to at some point get stuck. But of course the quills lying flat, they can reverse out. And it makes the most sense to have your most dangerous end facing the threat. So for warthog it's the front with the tusks, for porcupines it's the back end with the, with the quills. Now interestingly, quite often you see with porcupines and the den sites, is they often bring bring quills back to the den site or where they are and B Wilson you've asked me for something specific I just want to I haven't quite clearly heard exactly what it is but B Wilson I'm going to find out exactly what you wanted to oh there we go perfect okay B Wilson would like to see a sort of a cross section of a nest well B Wilson I'll keep an eye out for you let's see what plan we can make but first of all Vim and myself need to navigate our way out of here and I think it would probably be better if we did that off air in case I uh, tumble down into the drainage line or Vim tumbles down into the drainage line. So while we escape from our sandy, sandy prison, <laughs> let's pop over and find out what Scott's up to. Well, interesting stuff over there with Jamie and her burrows. Wouldn't it be nice to know if there was in fact an aardvark in there just a few meters away from you guys. We are now in the domain of the Anderson male leopard. He likes to lurk around this large riverbed system that flows off to the right hand side of where we are here. And he could pop up his head at any stage. Over the radio network, though, I haven't heard any major updates on Arethusa. There doesn't seem to be too much that has been located yet, but that doesn't mean that there are not animals nearby. So, I'm remaining optimistic. It's been a long time since we've seen the Anderson male. And we're basically heading kind of south down the, the western fringe of... Arethusa. We can't go much further west. There's one road that runs parallel to the riverbed on the other side of it, yeah, that we can drive along. But this is just about as far west as we go, and we'll shortly be popping out at the Arethusa waterhole, which is going to be very interesting because I haven't seen its state of affairs in quite a long time. I haven't seen how much water's left there. So that'll be interesting to see what's going on. I'm sure there is still some water and hopefully that will be attracting some game. Hello 
out to Derek in New York. Uh, you interested to know if there are any updates on another leopard we could bump into here, Shadow, a female. And not that I've heard of, although I forgot to mention, I did find some tracks that I am quite sure might be hers. They were right in the north uh, western corner of Juma. It's like the Bermuda Triangle there, so I didn't try and follow up. Um, they were kind of heading towards Sydney's Dam, which is where we had come from after we left, the, well, where we saw those giraffe, as uh, giraffe, zebra drinking. Um, so I thought they were her tracks, judging by the area that they were in. But uh, Derek, you'd like to know a little bit more about her and whether or not there's been any more confirmed uh, updates on whether she has cubs or not, and no. No confirmed sightings and or updates on that. So again, even though there was speculation that she did have cubs, and I think guys did see her with suckle marks, she too, like her mother, again speculation, may well have lost her cubs. Again, no surprises. And in my career, I have seen many, many, many leopards, more so, it far outweighs uh, the leopards losing cubs far outweighs them raising them far 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 so i think the two of them may have been unlucky but let's hope that that's not the case it's just that their behavior has appeared to indicate that they don't have cubs and the reason why is that if a leopard does have a den she goes backwards and forwards and if you've got half decent trackers around they're going to notice these tracks beelining up and down on the same kind of pathways to the same area um, whereas we haven't had that. Again, it could be through default, they could be moving the den sites often, um, or it could be the more likely fact that the cubs are no longer. Hello, Andy and Julia in LA and you guys uh, have heard of the theory that leopards will lift up their tails kind of high up above their back when they are kind of waving the white flag they are showing everyone that they're there they uh, you know proving a point that they're not trying to creep up on anything and the reason or the theory behind them doing that is so that they do not uh, create a lot of alarm calls or attention to them. Obviously a leopard who's going back to den site doesn't want to create a lot of alarm calls and a fuss about that because it may attract other predators to those alarm calls like lion or hyena may come and investigate, hey, what's going on here? Why, why, is, uh, why is the general game getting so nervous there? So, I have seen that happening. I'm not too convinced about the whole theory. That doesn't make entire sense. I mean, everything knows that a leopard is potentially dangerous. So even though, yes, I have seen them holding up their tails once they have been spotted to kind of acknowledge it, I'm not sure if that's a frustration thing or exactly how it works. I'm basically not convinced by that theory. It doesn't really add up to me because whether you're a leopard with your tail up or your tail down, animals are going to panic, you know? So. And I have noticed the same, basically the same amount of panic and alarm calls when they do hold their tails up. Hello to Ellen in Arkansas. I'd like to know if there's any plants or anything really that animals could feed on that would cause their behavior to be strange um, or any major kind of upsets. And not that I've ever seen. Um, it is possible though, like I said earlier with the giraffe, I mean, one thing I've noticed with the giraffe that was feeding on Tambuti was that it had an incredibly long trail of saliva trailing out of its mouth it was probably like half a meter long obviously with the giraffe having such a long neck there's no risk of the saliva touching the ground or anything really and um, so there's long trails of saliva coming out of the mouth but the behavior wasn't any different so 
It was just that it was salivating. Um, what am I not thinking about? What may induce some kind of interesting behavior when animals feed on a certain substance? Hmm. I'm coming up with a blank, Ellen. But that's not to say that there aren't a few plants that do have some interesting effects on the animals out here. for one particular viewer, Easy, who was wanting to see a European bee eater earlier. And there's apparently one on the Juma water hole cam. And obviously we don't like to send you away from our live safaris, but if you're sending you away to the live water hole cam for a few seconds to see one of your favorite birds, of course, that's not a bad thing. So if you'd like to see that pretty bird, sneak across, but please come back and join us on safari. Oh, uh, it's flown away, so don't bother. <laughs> But maybe after the drives, it will be worth investing some time there. Nikki does say it is often on the Juma cam. interesting information from Jeffrey in Texas. Thank you so much, Jeff, for sending this through. And I was discussing how the local African people quite enjoy purging their systems by feeding on various toxic plants, usually. You mentioned that there's a frog that people in Central America used to lick, or quite possibly still do lick, in all, again, in order to purge their systems. So... Thank you very much for that little nugget of information. There's a frog here called the banded rubber frog. Very pretty frog, black with either red, red or yellow markings on its back. And that too is also highly toxic. You don't even want to handle that. Perry in the UK, you would like to know what spiders we get here. We get all kinds of spiders. All web spiders, funnel web spiders, which I think I've just seen a web of. Down to our left, yeah, that does look like a funnel web spider down there. Let me jump out. But uh, you name it, we've got it regarding spiders, jumping spiders, big spiders, small spiders. We've got a spider like a tarantula called the baboon spider. Oh yeah, this is really cool. I'm not sure if you can see the funnel from there. Can you see the little hole, Dave? Not really in here. You can see all the webbing. You might just be able to see the small hole. And I actually did see the spider. It's sitting in there. Well, it was. As I approached, it disappeared. I might be able to simulate a bug being caught there and it might be able to lure it back out by just touching a little portion of the web here and shaking like a butterfly. It may work. No. No joy. So there's a, there's a spider for you, the funnel web spider. I think I'm in your way. Anyway, I don't think we're going to get a good view of it. Um, but there we go. Many, many different types of spiders though. And one of the best places to see spiders is on the bushwalk. And I'm sure Nikki is going to tell them to keep their eye out for any spiders for you. 
Uh, Steph, who's on the bush walk with Jamie, is a spider fanatic. He loves them, especially jumping spiders. He goes bananas when he sees them. Um, and I think it was yesterday morning. Yes, it was yesterday morning. That James found a garden orbweb spider, a beautiful spider, quite a large spider. Sadly, we don't have as many uh, orbweb spiders out this summer as we usually do, and that's due to the drought entirely, I think. There's not as many insects around to feed them, so they've been growing very slowly. But usually they're very large spiders. Well, maybe that's legs included. Um, they're quite spindly, but they're large. And their nests are a beautiful golden coloration, very, very strong webbing. Or well, Anna Marie, um, thank you for your wishful thinking with the hope that we're gonna find the Anderson Mail. This is the place where it can happen. The first time I saw him was just a little bit further behind where we are now, but he often lurks through this very, very area. So it's highly possible that we will get lucky now, Anna Marie, and apologies that you haven't seen him yet. To be honest, the two times I've seen him, the first sighting was pretty cool, but it was very short-lived. He was lying down as we got there, he got up and then walked off within minutes. Um, but it was a beautiful scene but short. Quality, not quantity though. Then the second sighting was one of the biggest letdowns of my guiding career. I was responding to a sighting with both Tingana and the Anderson male who were allegedly having some kind of a debate. When we got there, they were kind of hardly acknowledging one another. You could hear Tingana very, very, very softly growling, but it was a letdown. It was a massive letdown. And they basically just slept next to one another. And we could hardly see the Anderson male where he was sleeping. Okay, now I've got some sad news for sensitive viewers. I would suggest maybe closing one ear and one eye. This is very tragic what I'm about to show you. Now, if you look below here on the ground, you can see what used to be a mud wallow and it's completely bone dry no more water sad for whatever may have wanted to wallow here the warthogs the buffalo whatever may have wanted to drink here also unfortunate times but more importantly if we look above me these animals are the ones that are going to have the worst outcome this is the foam nest of a foam nest frog. Just going to touch it gently. Oh, foamy. I'll actually bring a little bit back with me because the bottom line is, is that whatever tadpoles would have hatched in there and then plummeted out of the sky down into what was once a wallow, is now no longer. So they would have just landed in the dust or had they have not landed in the dust, maybe they landed in the water that shortly thereafter dried up. So, sad reality. Um, what's interesting is that the female foam nest frog um, will beat her legs together as she secretes this kind of liquid that turns into a foam and she'll have up to like five or six even more sometimes males clambering all over her uh, and then they will be the ones that are how could I have forgotten this word doing something to the eggs making the eggs fertile fertilizing the eggs is what I'm trying to get at late night last night obviously and this is the foam that those eggs will develop in. it's quite interesting I've actually never felt it before no ways it's like candy floss feel that Dave it's literally just like candy floss. Um, so that's where the eggs would have been developing. Obviously, once the tadpole is big enough, it then falls out of the, the foam and then disappears uh, while it falls into the water, which is hopefully below it. But in this case, that wasn't, wasn't to be. Sorry, froggies. This drought's not doing you any, any good, eh? <clears throat> 
So, the candy floss nest frog, or foam nest frog. Julian in Connecticut, good day and good to have you with us. You've interested to, to work out how is it that leopards and lion, who both have high mortality rates of the young and I guess cheetah even as well, how do they actually manage to survive and have a decent population if they lose so many young? Um, it's a good point, but I guess it just emphasizes that it's survival of the fittest, you know, and unless it's really meant to be, predators will not make it. And that does make sense, because if we had predators around every corner, there would not be enough food to sustain them. It just simply wouldn't be sustainable. And there also wouldn't be enough space for them. There wouldn't be enough territory for them. I mean, if we think of all of the leopard cubs that get lost, if those weren't to get lost, I mean, there'd just be a leopard in every tree we drove around here. Considering how long they can live for, considering how much they need to eat, you know, it makes it makes sense that all of the, the young don't survive in terms of populations and, and, and the sustainability of things. Um, and again, like I said, it also just ensures that only the strongest genes are getting through. Often, it's male leopard are the number one killers of leopard cubs. And that ensures that only the dominant male who's really staked claim to an area will be able to have his cubs, make sure there's no other intruding males at the time. And then those cubs will be the ones that make it through. Again, if they're lucky enough to be killed, not by, or not be killed by hyena or lion. Um, but if you look at the Sabi Sands, I mean, we've got a very, very healthy leopard population here. A great leopard population. And there's, obviously, everyone would like a few more leopards on their property. But in reality, there's plenty of leopards around. And all of these leopards, all of these females, or many females, lose lots of cubs. So it's just the kind of way it is, I guess. It's the way of the wild. <clears throat> Oh, apologies, um, a little bit of an intercontinental difference here in terms of what we call our different sweets. Here in South Africa, we call candy floss that substance that gets put on a stick, usually at fun fairs. Maybe you call a fun fair a carnival, <laughs> not sure, but you call it cotton candy, not candy floss. So there we go we call ketchup tomato sauce as well. That's another difference here in South Africa. Any others that you can think of, Dave? Major differences? I'll put you on the spot, but that's because I can't think of any others. Uh, chips and fries, soda. We don't call soda, really. We call uh, them fizzy drinks because of the bubbles. Um, so they don't really call them soda too much. We call it either a Coke or a Fanta, we don't call it a soda, so much. Uh, what else, what else, what else? Yeah, we'll, we'll keep thinking about it. Oh, bonnet's hood. We call the front of a vehicle the bonnet. You call it the hood and an oh, obvious South African one. We call our traffic lights robots. What next? Makes perfect sense to us until we actually think about it. It looks nothing like a, well, I guess it could look something like a robot, but a robot without any arms or legs. And its only function is to flash light. Ah, oh, gas and petrol, that's another one. We don't call it gas, we call it petrol. And in South Africa, we don't have to fill up our own gas. You put into a petrol station or a gas station, and there are people there that put the fuel into your car. So that's another difference between here and the States. Good, well, I'm about to take Dave to the Arethusa Dam, and we'll let you know if there's anything there when we get there. The first view he is gonna have of that area and the lodge, and we're gonna send you over to Jamie on our way there. So I think 
in the cotton candy floss cotton what's it called again now i've completely lost what we call it candy floss candy floss versus cotton candy i think that yeah i think that vm's got it absolutely right the best name is the afrikaans name for it spook awesome ghost's breath I think that's a perfect example of good naming, appropriate naming, although apparently ghosts have very, very sweet breath. But you can see it, you can see the crystallization, the idea behind it, much more of a descriptive name. You'll notice I'm keeping an eye out sort of towards my right. The reason I'm doing that is because I've noticed a lot of ox pickers moving across. Now ox pickers, for those of you who don't know, are a really, really important sign and sound of the bush because they sit on animals like buffalo. They also sit, of course, on giraffe and on kudu. In, the particular, in this particular case, it was a big male kudu that they were attracted to. Oh, there's his track, actually. Or oh, there's, there's a smaller kudu's track. This can't be a large male that I was looking at. And look here. Just talking about the stuff that you can learn from tracks. Here's his track here. Moving in this, towards me in this direction. Look how it's flicked. I wonder whether or not that kudu was running. It's quite, usually quite indicative of an animal moving quickly. Although sometimes they drag their feet, just like we sometimes do, when we get lazy. But it's amazing the number of different, just to go onto a different sub, oh no, let me finish off with my ox peckers. So ox peckers are really an important sound to listen out for in the bush. They can give away the position of an animal really, really clearly, and that's important when you're walking through because 80% of the time you are going to hear something before you see it out here. Okay, this is a bit different in this particular season and the way that or how dry it is and the amount of visibility that we have. But it's always very, very important to listen to the sounds of the bush and what it's telling you. Now we know we've seen buffalo multiple times and the number of ox pickers that sit on them. I have a nice idea. Since we're here, should we go pop into the old hyena den and let's investigate what's happening there? Now, uh, I would investigate on foot, regardless of whether or not it would be active. Oh my word, I've got an entourage of flies. Uh, the hyenas are very, very comfortable with people on foot. You don't, obviously you don't constantly move about a den site on foot. They're much more comfortable with the vehicle. But finding, it, finding an active den site on foot and exploring it is actually a really nice, it's probably the only way of finding an active den. This is the old Gallagher shortcut den. You can see already evidence of a time when hyenas inhabited this place. You can really actually nicely see the hollow where hyenas managed to break open this bone and get to the bone marrow inside. And that of course is what they are specifically adapted to be able to do. Crunching that power of that jaw. It's the reason that their neck and their shoulders are structured like that. Uh, we're just going to stroll our way towards the old den site and while we do, Scott has made his way to the Arethusa Dam so let's find out what's come down to drink. So we've just arrived at the Arethusa waterhole and there is a marabou stork, one of the less fortunate looking birds these less fortunate looking stalks, but the good news is it's hunting. And we may see it catch a frog or a catfish in what little moisture remains at the Arethusa waterhole. I'm not shocked, but surprised to see how dry it has become. And as Dave zooms out, you'll get a good idea of just how little water remains here. And due to the dissipating amounts of water, the hippos have also disappeared, all but one. I can see one, there may be more in here. And the one that is here, there's the camp, for those of you who are new to Safari Life, this is Arathusa. Now, wouldn't that be a nice spot to stay? The views overlooking where we are here. The hippos just out in the thickness there, Dave will show you exactly where it is, just behind this little stump sticking out of the water. You can just see a little, what looks to be a rock there. That is a hippopotto rock. So I'm not sure where all the other hippos would have gone to, but that is the reality of the drought. There's a few general, a few 
different antelope species around here as well. We've got some kudu, some minyala. The kudu are the lighter species and more gray. And the minyala are the rusty and chocolate, cho chocolate brown colored ones at the back. So two of the spiral horned antelopes. And then further to the left, there's a massive herd of impala. scattered about over there and then even further left of them is a lone waterbuck bull who's enjoying just chilling out on the open clearing so now one of you i didn't catch your name too clearly but i'll i'll get reminded of it now is interested to know if a cr crocodile can survive without the end of its nose as the crocodile fight has escalated and it sounds like the big crocodile has removed the end of the small crocodile's nose. Sabrina is just 12 years old. It's hard to say. Um, it sounds like quite a bad injury, to be honest. Um, so I'm not feeling too hopeful that it will survive. But we must always remember that these animals never, never, never give up. And they're very, very tough. So it is possible that maybe just maybe it will survive and some strange things do happen out here in nature and against all odds some animals may survive what are these kudu looking at you don't mind zooming into them is it the marabou stork Is there something else, like a snake possibly? Look how it's changed posture now. What's happening here? Look at the way the kudu even now, it's coming closer to investigate. Let's go and, let's go and have a look. I'm hoping it's seen a snake. I'm not sure if it was looking beyond. No, it's looking right down there on the ground. you seen? Ah, oh, there's something, there's something amiss here. I'm just scanning with my binoculars. If I can't see anything more, I'm going to jump off and have a closer look on foot. Maybe they're just panicking though, maybe, the, maybe they're looking at a little rock here behind this dead tree that's making them feel like there's a predator. Obviously, as they get close to the water's edge, which they're heading towards, they will become more and more nervous. So I think it's that. I think it's, there's also a bit of a breeze picking up now. I think the combination of the breeze and the fact that they're at the water's edge is what's causing them to be nervous. Now... The problem at this time of the year and during a drought or even in the winter season is that when antelope try and drink they need to get through a thick layer of mud before they get to the water's edge and can sometimes become stuck. It is something that I can almost guarantee is going to happen at some point and I'm not sure whether intervening is the right thing to do, stealing an easy meal away from the predators. I'd be inclined not to intervene, although some people do intervene in these circumstances. Oh, look, the ones on the left there are kind of, I think, beginning to get into some softer mud. Oh, yeah, you can see it's going to start sinking in and it might come out with dark. Dark socks. It's like they're getting a little bit of moisture there, so that's good news. And I don't think they're going to get stuck. They're not disappearing too deep into the mud either, so that's good. Yeah, they're definitely getting some water there, and it looks like they're not going to get stuck just yet.
just got a comment through from Tony who's watching on YouTube and Tony isn't it remarkable just how big those ears are like you say especially in relation to their heads like massive satellite receivers and that's because kudu being browsers often live in thick vegetation so evolutionary it's it's made sense to have good hearing not that they've got bad eyesight because often hearing their prey is going to be more effective than possibly seeing their prey but well spotted it is certainly a characteristic of the kudu Hello to James Taylor, who remembered when he was growing up that the storks were often used to deliver babies. And yes, the same thing happens here in South Africa. So interesting how that has spread at least from where you are to where we are here. But that certainly was the case. I'm not too sure whether it's still applicable or applied to the younger generations of South Africa, but it certainly was the case when I was growing up. Very good. Bye-bye, Kudu and Wan and Yala. The rusty colored individual in the middle of them there. There's the old waterbuck chewing the cut on the left. Oh, there he goes. And yes, there are big antelope the water back grease look at it go and it's not the biggest antelope we get in South Africa that is the um, eland which we sadly do not see sorry hold on I just said a very interesting update Last station, could you go again with the uh, update on that Shkankan, please? Good morning, Scott. They, they are tortured now. I'm close to Mkoro. Okay, copy. Good luck. Enjoy. Yeah. Sadly, we cannot go there, but there's a cheetah just east of Juma lying on a termite mound, which got me very excited. I thought the initial um, update that I got made it sound like it could have been on the southern boundary of Juma. So the greater kudu weighs 200, up to 250 kilos, the male. Okay, so that's the largest antelope that we get here. I'm just having a quick look now for the waterbuck. I'm not sure I've forgotten how much they weigh. I'm guessing it's not going to be too far behind that. Yeah, 250 to 270. So the waterbuck and the kudu are kind of tie largest, but if anything, the waterbuck can get slightly larger. So the waterbuck will be the largest in this area, then the kudu, but the largest that we can see in Southern Africa is the eland, which will be up into the four, five, 600 kilogram mark. They are ginormous, they're like cows. Let me actually double check how big those Elan gets because it could probably even be bigger than what I've just said. 700 to 900 kilograms, the males, almost a ton. Very good, that guy's just enjoying chewing the cud now, making sure he digests his food very well. I could certainly learn a lesson from the antelope. I don't chew my food nearly enough before swallowing it. Well, Jamie did say that she was going to be heading off to the old hyena den to look for any fossils and artifacts. So, why don't you guys go over and see what she's managed to find. Hyena den, definitely not active at the moment. 
got plenty of signs that the hyenas were around at some point, which obviously we know, but it would be interesting from the perspective of, let's say, we were finding this for the first time. And I've noticed a couple of little bones lying around, not too much in the way of dung, or scat actually would be the correct terminology. That's because generally, for the most part, you don't see them defecating around their den site, or at least close to the den site, unless it's a young cub. Generally, they will tend to defecate, not even necessarily leave the burrow at a young age to go out and defecate. So you don't often find them necessarily at the den site itself, but of course they have latrines. And quite often you can follow and look at the way that latrines are gathered around the den site and you, along the regularly used pathways. And what was interesting about this den and the way in which the hyenas approached it, when we first started visiting, they generally used the game paths to the south of us. But as soon as the road started to develop, where people were coming in and out of the den site, they started using that. Hyenas love, much like all of the animals, love to use roads. And before I put it down, it is desperately trying to escape. Oh, that's unfortunate. I hope it didn't fall on me. <laughs> oh, that's so sad. Where's my... Pre oh, there it is. Here we go. That, was, that wasn't terribly coordinated on my part, or in fact the tick's part. Come here, tick. Relax, I'm not going to eat you. I promise you that, I'm not going to eat you. That's staying very still. But there you go, that's what I was trying to show you. Okay, I give up. That, that tick doesn't want to be seen. <laughs> it's a really pretty one as well. Let's try one more time. Should we just, should we just approach it from that? I think vm has got the right idea. There you go. It looks like probably a little... Not a bond tick, maybe one of the red ticks. Ouch and definitely one of the ticks that you'd find on multiple species. Here we go. Stop for a moment and you can get an idea of the coloration and pattern. Not an insect that I would say is, I would ever thought I would call pretty, but in fact this is quite an attractive tick as ticks go. Still don't want to find it attached to any body parts. You can really get an idea of those mouth parts and how strong and solid they have to be to get through the thick skins of the animals. So this little tick, wandering around waiting for a host species to pass by that it can climb onto and jump onto, and then engorge itself. And depending on what species of tick it is, they have different stages of life cycle. And you know, it really is drizzling on us. It's quite nice. Really nice, cool morning. But yes, depending on the type of tick, will either, either have a one phase, two phase or three phase life cycle which is the number of times that it will attach itself to a host species and then drop off and the, the, the number of times it um, goes through some kind of, not metamorphosis, but what's the word I'm looking for in terms of its growth. It'll come to me. It will definitely come to me. What we've been trying to do, since we are at the hyena den, is investigate the sort of interconnectedness of the tunnels because we very often when we were here We'd see the cubs and they mainly used the entrance at the top of the den here. But they very often popped out either on that side or on the other side of the termite mound. Very difficult to see though. I haven't been able to... A lot of the tunnels have collapsed almost completely without the excavations of the cubs. And I've been trying to... Viam shone his torch into one side, I went to the other side to try and see if I could see it. Doesn't seem to come through, but we know that they are connected because we've seen the cubs come through and into the, onto the other side. And since we're here, I also thought it might be quite nice. We could never really get the vehicle around to show you the one entrance. And towards the end of this, their time at this den, the most recent time, they actually moved to the other side. I'm going to show you how nice that partic and protected that particular entrance is. From my hugely unsuccessful attempt to catch that tick while we walk around to the side of the den, Tony wanted to know if you could get sick from those types of tick. And yes, you can. It's not to the same extent as, for example, Lyme disease is a very serious thing within Europe and within the Northern Americas. So you can get Lyme disease from your types of ticks. We personally get something known as tick bite fever. It is a type of bacteria, rickettsia, and it is carried, apparently the statistics are about one in a thousand ticks carries tick bite fever. I've had it, I've also been bitten, I'm fairly certain, well over a thousand, probably close to five thousand times. I seem to be a bit of a tick magnet. 
and I've had it once. It hasn't been that serious. Brent had it a little while back, or we think he had it a little while back. Generally easily, easily treatable. Just a quick course of doxycycline antibiotic and you're good to go. So they carry a disease, but it's not too serious. I'm looking at this mark in the ground here and just wondering whether or not they dragged something back. And it's starting to tie together. Remember the Nkuhuma search that we had where we knew that we'd missed a kill? It probably wasn't a huge kill, but we definitely missed a kill within this block. And when we found them again on Impala Road, they were very full-bellied. It was a bit of a competition between Brent and myself, and he shot past me and found them, which I was definitely cheating. And they were very full-bellied, and they'd had a kill around here. We were following vultures repeatedly. And I think this is an old drag mark from that carcass. The den site, the active den site, is just about 100 meters to the east of where we are. It's sort of roughly there-ish in about 100 meters. Interesting. It's all tying together and that explains why I'm seeing vulture fluff as well. This is the entrance that I was trying to tell you about. You can see this is where they move to towards the end. How nice and protected and shaded this particular spot is. It's a perfect hyena dead spot. The network of roots and systems and when the hyenas do decide to move back here, which they will do, Hyenas do repeatedly use den sites. When they do decide to move back here, the hyena cubs will be able to excavate their way back into it. Now there's full of little signs, little chewed bits of wood and twigs. You know how the hyena cubs love to teeth and explore. And they tend to gnaw on the ends of the sticks that they can find. And there's plenty of evidence of that. The other thing that we always associate with the hyena den is the smell. And Tammy wanted to know, does it smell bad? Does it still smell bad? Or has that smell sort of dissipated? I stuck my head into the hole, not quite into the hole, but next to the hole, and I had a good sniff, Tammy, and it's, it doesn't smell nearly as bad as it did um, without any of the hyenas being around. I know I mentioned that I definitely smelt the fresh smell of death a couple of weeks ago around this den site. So Tammy, it doesn't smell terrible, but there's still the sense that the hyenas were here. I can't describe it. It's, it no longer smells like rotting meat or anything of the sort, but it does, it definitely carries an odour to it. I wanted to show you, I'm trying to look for more of it, back to that drag mark. Remember how we had all of those vultures? I'm just going to go find, I'm going to go back around the side of this den and just show you the vulture down that I spotted. And that's probably because they were using this dead tree as a perch. <laughs> Angie's on the same page as we are, in a, in a way. Angie has said, wouldn't it be cool, wouldn't it be neat to send the rover down the hyena den tunnel? And Angie, we, we actually had that conversation about the art, or the suspected art fog burrow that we saw, sending the rover down in, to explore. I don't know how Graham might feel about that. Perhaps we should ask him. What do you think, Vim? I think we should ask him. I think that is a good, good use to put it through. Oh, well that sounds like something exciting. There's the vulture down that I was looking at, but Scott has got another animal in a tree to show you. Well, take a look at this. A rock monitor lizard. I'm just using the flashlight to try and illuminate it. Um, difficult to see though, and it looks like almost nothing's there. But that's testament to how well camouflage they are there. I'm shining the spotlights a bit better now. And he's just taking it easy. He'll live in this cavity, head out and forage. Maybe you've got a number of cavities that it spends its time in. But on a cool day like this, he's probably just waiting for a bit of sunshine to warm up that cold-blooded body before it heads up. Oh, uh, he winked at us. Obviously, we're doing something right. And Earlier on we were chatting about differences of what we may call certain things here in South Africa and what the Americans viewers may call things and Bud, thank you very much for highlighting another one that I didn't remember and that was what we call a torch, you call a flashlight and quite applicable now as I am using a flashlight to try and illuminate this rock monitor lizard. It's probably about three feet in length I'm guessing to give you an idea of what's below in that cavity, about 
one and a half feet of which is body and another one and a half feet length of tail. They've got a very big bulbous head compared to their cousin, the now monitor lizard, and that's one way of distinguishing them, a much more robust head, um, as well as less bright colorations. They're more dull and bland than their water-dwelling cousin. Let's see if we can't get you a little bit closer to this one. We may as well take a bit of a gamble. its beady little eye. I'm hoping it decides to stick out its forked tongue to smell the air to test our scent because that'll be great to see. Come on, put out that forked tongue of yours. It's got quite a fascinating little eyeball there. And aren't we lucky that it is a cool day. There's even a few small drops of rain falling on us nothing too serious but a few tiny little drops of drizzle i'm not sure what it's like across on juma but this weather could be on the way there it usually goes from west to east oh i missed the tongue i was looking away but you guys got to see it so well done unless of course some of you were blinking like i was at the time very good Mike Costin, you would like me to give you the thoughts on what this lizard may be thinking about. Sheesh, doesn't look like too much, to be honest. Um, looked like it was sporting a serious hangover, if you're asking me. Hardly had any expression on its face, so I've, I've got absolutely no guesses as to what it was thinking. It was maybe actually thinking, let me just keep still. And maybe they actually aren't watching me. Maybe they're just taking a look at this marula tree. Uh, yeah, so maybe that's what I was thinking. Very good. It's been a while since I've found you guys, one of those monitors poking their holes out of the crevasse of a marula tree. It's one of the most common places we spot them out here. Eric in Virginia Beach, you are wondering what animals will we see in this area seasonally and uh, you know in winter they'll be here and summer they won't and vice versa and it's only the birds really that are migratory and um, the rest of the animals we see here throughout the year although you know some of the reptiles uh, snails also you know we only see them in, in the summer months so even though they're here they're just in estivation they are hiding out during the winter waiting for the summer bounty which has not arrived this year but yeah it's mainly birds that migrate here or animals that estivate here come out in the summer months and lie dormant in the winter which is dry we don't have any major migrations of, of mammals coming and going from this area. There's slight seasonal changes, but each season may differ to the next. Well, the Eric's are piling up on safari life now we've got one in new york who would like to know if it's normal for a giraffe to move alone um for the males fairly common for them to move alone yes uh, for the females less common you're more likely to see females in, in small herds although in some parts of africa you can get herds of 20 30 40 giraffe moving together so a lot depends on where in Africa you are. The same species will often act differently in different parts of Africa. 
Um, but the bulls, yes, not uncommon for them to be alone. The female that we saw earlier, even though she appeared to be alone, maybe there were a few more giraffes just ahead of her that we couldn't see in the thick bush. Approaching the Arethusa airstrip, maybe we're going to find a cheetah here, who knows. Who knows? I do like these open expanses though. Hello Heidi in Arizona, I'm not sure if you were tuned in earlier, you obviously weren't because then you would have seen my description and chat, oh sorry, about the gravy zebra, I did show it in the book so I don't know how possibly you couldn't have seen it unless you were not watching, but we do not get them here, we only get them in East Africa, the only zebra we get here is the virtual zebra. Now, feast your eyes on this. This is what you call a bush breakfast that is busy being set up for the lucky Arethusa guests. Can you believe it? White tablecloths, you can see all the juices on the table there, the waiters getting all the stuff ready, the chefs on the right of the operation there. I think he's just disappeared behind the car, he's running around frantically. That's Dave, the head chef at Arethusa, he's a very talented chef. I think he may be starting up a fire. Dave! <laughs> He's so busy he doesn't even know we're here. He started the fire. Dave! Oh no, he's not going to hear us now because he started the car. There's the roaring fire. And awesome stuff. Maybe he's, for, maybe he's forgot the bacon and eggs back at the camp and that's why he's rushing off. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely forgot something important. <laughs> anyway, it's not uncommon to have these wonderful bush breakfasts uh, when you come out to uh, come out on safari. It's quite a lavish experience, there's nothing rough about being out on safari, especially in the Sabi sands. It obviously depends on where you go and how rough you like it, but the Sabi sands... Oh, I need to get out of Dave's way. Sorry Dave, what did you forget? <laughs> you forgot the glasses. <laughs> and off he goes. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, so not uncommon, like I said, to be spoiled, having a bush breakfast out in the bush sometimes. What will even happen is you'll be driving around after dark with the spotlights, and next thing you come around the corner and you arrive at the most beautiful outdoor restaurants imaginable, lanterns everywhere, up in the trees, chefs in their white suits, having a dinner under the stars. So very, very special moments are made out here by the camps and the staff that work out here. They really go out of their way. Again, it, you know, I'm talking in general, so don't quote me if you go to a lodge and this doesn't happen. Um, but in general, they really do go out of their way to make sure that everyone that comes from far and wide does get absolutely spoiled rotten. protocol to forget something. Okay, interesting. I've just got a radio call saying that you guys need to go over to Jane because she has some good news. What does that mean? Go and see. Guys, we just had the most awesome sighting. We bumped into a I suspect one of the Inkuhuma females. She was just behind the squarry bush. We were following alarm calls. An entire herd of impala came racing across the road and I suspect she might have been hunting them. 
And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try and call, I'm not entirely sure where, um, where Scott might be. I think he's still on Arethusa, but I'm going to call in one of the other vehicles to come and follow up. And we're really, really close to Galago Pan. I'm just going to call this in. Stations I had visual of one fuzzy Ngala from Galago Shortcut. Very, very close to the link road with Galago Pan. There is the alarm calls. She's moved off towards in that direction. Keep your eyes peeled. There, can you hear that? Impala shouting. That's harsh. Ba ba ba. Now Impala don't do that for nothing. It's usually leopard, cheetah, lion. Now I know that it doesn't come through too clearly on my mic, but you do get it through. Now the one thing that I can't do is follow her through this bush. Can you see the Impala? Yeah. There's a chance she could come out this way. Just keep your eyes peeled. There's a nice open spot I want to just go look for. As I said, I'm not going to follow her, but I do want to move into an open gap where we have a chance of seeing her. Now she was, she did see us. There's the Impala there. They're looking straight in here. There's a nice open space. She's, oh, that's Impala. <laughs> I thought I saw her moving through. But she's somewhere in this thicket here. The Impala all staring off in her direction. Let's just see if we can get a visual from the open clearing. Morning, Impala. Was that a bit of a rude awakening? They were staring off just into this gap in that direction. And the Impala are going to move off away from where she was. She was just moving through in here and I think she's still moving in that direction. It's awesome stuff. What, an, what a really cool end to our sunrise safari. So the Nkuma ladies were, well, I suspect it was the Nkuhuma ladies and they were still on the property. So it was males that we heard calling this morning. Now to try and do an approach now, we could do it. We're going to get me met with two responses. We've already seen her once. She got a bit of a fright and she moved off straight away. So if we follow her through here, she's going to do one of two things. She's either going to get really cross with us and give us a bit of a growl or she's going to keep running. And obviously we don't want to do that. We don't want to push her to that extent. We had a, a really nice, brief, very close visual before she moved off. I'm not going to follow her through this bush. Unfortunately, as appealing as the idea is, all I'm going to do is scare her. But, oh, those tracks were so fresh this morning. I have tried to call in one of the vehicles. But what I'll try and do is after the end of our sunrise safari, we'll try and get to the vehicle and come and explore. They were... They were right at Galago Pan. That's where the lions were. We must have just, just missed them this morning. With those fresh tracks going down to the water, I assumed that they'd turned around and walked back to where Scott was. But obviously not. Hmm. One of those things. We need to go and get the vehicle, I think. Well, that's, um, as Shalina's also made a good point, she was saying, surely it's not a good idea to follow a lion on foot if it's hunting. Her hunt was over as soon as... Oh, sorry, here's Craig. Let me try and get hold of him. Craig, standing by. Morning, Jamie. Um, I'm just sure chatting to Sean. Apparently there's in Kwanza for Tingana and Tandi crossing north into Voyeurs. Um, Lucas open So Craig's just giving me an update about Tingana and Tundi coming onto the property, so we really do have some exciting prospects. Copy that. Thanks, Craig. Um, I'm not sure your position, but I've just had visual of one Mufazi Ngala on Galago shortcut, close to the shortcut junction to Galago Pan. Um, she's gone mobile now into the block, and I'm on foot, so I can't, I can't follow up. Okay, copy. Um, uh, so, Astralina, you were saying surely it's not a good idea to follow a hunting line. As I said, the hunt was over. Those immediate Impala alarm calls and the fact that they were racing across the road, it means the hunt for her was not going to happen. 
as soon as an impala spots something like a lion, as we've spoken before, they're very much ambush predators. But the reason I'm not following her further in on foot is because all I'm going to do is scare her further. So following, I'm not, I'm not necessarily following her, just trying to get an idea of exactly where she went. Bearing in mind also that our vehicle is straight back that way. So getting an idea of which way she's moved gives us a nice way of just looping around her and avoiding her. Of course, that being said, we don't actually know where the rest of the pride is. But yes, as soon as those, and you'll notice it with prey species, and you'll, I'm still standing listening for alarm calls while I'm here, but you'll notice very often with prey species that they'll be quite content to be quite close to the lions. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to an exciting end of our sunrise safari. I'm going to go and get the vehicle and try and find these lions w on the vehicle. And once I do that, then it holds promising prospects for this afternoon's sunset safari. Plus, of course, tracks of Tundi and Tingana coming onto Buyatella. As always, a big thank you to VM for being a hero with his backpack and not falling down into the drainage line and generally putting up with all kinds of odd requests to film things, including ticks. And as always, a big thank you to our viewers. As, well, as always, wonderful questions, wonderful comments. I hope you enjoyed this morning's bushwalk. We'll catch you this afternoon for the sunset safari. Cheers for now. Yay, this might be another bird for your bird lists. This is the Retz's helmet shrike. We don't see them very often. We more often see their cousins, the white crowned, white crested helmet shrike. There we go. We got that in the bag though. Oh, it looks like Dave may have spotted it again somewhere in there. It's so thick and windy, it's hard to tell what's going on in this marula tree. But you would have seen the bright red beak and the bright red eye around its eye. So I'm glad we could get you possibly another bird for your bird lists. What a morning it's been and well done to Jamie and the walking team for bumping into a lion. Awesome stuff. And hopefully they'll be able to work out exactly where it is and whether the whole Inkahuma pride is there. I'm guessing that they could have split up. Anyway, <coughs> it's been great fun. Thank you for joining us. Oh, I I heard you. I think it's just leaves rattling. So I was just making sure that it wasn't the snakes or something slithering through the undergrowth. But I think it was just the leaves blowing in the wind. Thank you so much, everyone involved. Nikki, who directed the show. Kirsty, Jerry, and Leanne, who I think we're all in the final control, possibly even Louise. Well done on your great camera work again, Dave. And thank you, of course, to all of you guys for joining us on the safari and sending through all of your questions, contributions, and action. I'm looking forward to the sunset safari already. We'll see you out there a little bit later.